again, LARP. It, LARP seems to be an interesting thing for this. And, and in fact, one of the authors is uh, uh, Nicole Winchester uh, had a bunch of experience doing high-end LARPs, right? As well as doing like old school mind's eye theater and things like that. But LARP often kind of serves as the real boot camp for, uh, for these kinds of things, just because you're in these, you know, often large groups, often with people you don't know, right? And you're managing uh, these intense social conflicts. But the example of scripting that I wanted to get into was a vampire LARP that I was in, um, where uh, I don't know how people are familiar with the Setites, which I think have a different name in V5 now, the followers of Set. There are these vampires who have this loose, like, uh, you know, corrupt other vampires agenda, right? They're never really, they were never really that clear about what corruption meant, but, uh, you know, um, they are notorious for like hiding among other vampires and then slowly turning others to their cause. And so there was a setite masquerading as a Toreador, a much better liked form of vampire in vampire, um, and who palled around with this Nosferatu, who are these like, you know, ugly vampires who live underground, right? And the I and so to do the thing where the setite corrupted the the Nosferatu, um, basically the two players uh, wrote it up um, as a scripted scene, right? They kind of did it as a form of collective blue booking. Uh, I don't know if every anybody do people not know what the term? Okay, blue booking is a term um, devised by the late Aaron Alston to describe the kind of writing that you would do when you talk about what your characters are up to and so on between sessions, right? Um, so what they did is they kind of scripted a kind of collective set of things that happened where they, uh, you know, they went on a trip together and uh, the set I betrayed the other character and fed them his blood and it was very evocative, but it meant that the two of them came back with a strong idea of who their characters were, what had just happened, and what they needed to do, right? So that scripting can be powerful for anyone, um, but it's, it's particularly powerful when you want to do things like social conflict or even complex social scenes or social scenes with a risky element, right? So romance is one. Often we feel very, you know, weird about, you know, simulating falling in love with improvised dialogue while rolling dice. I mean, for one thing, that is definitely something where you want to do an out of character check in. Because if, uh, if you've decided to, you know, if you decided you're interested in that, and the other character person isn't interested in doing that with their character, well, then you don't do it. <laughs> right and it's even the same if you want to play it as you know as unrequited love right because well th there are so many obnoxious possibilities i don't even want to go into them right so that scripting can be oh um i oh there are who who, who raised their whoever sorry. raised their hand please talk to me because the names are overlapped and gather down sorry about that uh <laughs> Ethan here with uh, Underworld LARP, actually. Um, you you were talking about it and these concepts that players aren't comfortable with, and I suppose this is less a question than an insight, but um, the our guild employs what we call a, a, a fade to black, which is in a situation where your character might want to explore like a romantic relationship and another mm -hmm. player's character might also want to explore a romantic relationship, but one or more of the players isn't comfortable with with the subject, mm -hmm. but they know that their character, like for in-game reasons would be. Yeah. Right? Um we we allow like the fade to black. Like it's kind of like a this happens, but yeah. we're not gonna go into great detail. We're gonna I think you called it blue booking. Um well I mean in the like in the context I was talking about for tabletop, yeah, it can be seen as kind of a collective form of blue booking where you're writing about it, um, but you're not playing it, right? In the conventional sense, I mean, you can, but you know, I've heard of you know, I've heard of fake black, and yeah, that's a great technique, and you can use it with or without 
more descriptiveness, right? By writing about it, right? You, it's all right to leave things to the imagination too, right? Um, and, yeah, so I totally agree that that is a great, you know, fade to black is a great technique. Um, and it is one of the things that's talked about in, in safety discussions as well. Um, I don't want to go too deeply into safety tools just because uh, I'm not on the forefront of developing those. Um, and, uh, and there are a lot of options. Um, I am also generally cautious about anything where, you know, I might make an assertion about how somebody's psychological state states work. Um, because I guess I, I mean, I am, I'm always concerned um, that people are respectful, not just in terms of, you know, uh, helping people uh, feel comfortable in the play environment, but also in not assuming too much about how they come to their decisions, right? Um, and I'd like to, let's move along a bit. Um, yeah, so I've talked about bad faith uh, and, you know, people with bad faith characteristics, you know, you can't play with them, right? Because if they intend to be mean to you, then there's no point, right? Um, we assume good faith, but we don't tolerate it when uh, when it doesn't come to us. And of course, when it comes to things like public play, conventions, I've met people for the first time, of course, you know, you want to be more cautious, right? In a common sense way, um, I think a lot of I think a lot of things boil down to not treating the space in which we play RPGs as the space that is outside of normal social consequences, right? In the early 2000s, there was a lot, um, there were a lot of electrons expanded on the idea of that you had this shared magical space that was different from the ordinary world where wondrous things happened. Um, and there's no, I mean, certainly conceptually, we can think in those terms a bit, and we can acknowledge that we have these great experiences from playing RPGs, but we are not separated from the rest of the world, right? And even though as a technique, our players and our, uh, being a player is different from being, you know, being in character, you know, in truth, the character is just something that you are performing as a real person, right? So we can't do this thing where, you know, everything we do is totally insulated from, you know, the same things that we expect in terms of respect and inclusiveness and accommodation in normal social discussion. <laughs> and that's where I wanna kind of take things to um, so advice that is often used on one side of the player GM divide that could probably be used on both sides, right? And one of them is not tolerating this common thing, which is I'm just doing what my character would do. So um, have people ever heard or read that right before someone did something that was really annoying? Yes. <laughs> so I'm just doing what my character would do as if that is a moral defense, as if your character is this magical person who makes their own decisions. And they are not. They are you. You're responsible for their decisions. Um, <laughs> and you're responsible for when their decisions are bad and hurtful to others hurtful to others as players, right? That's why we have the, you know, direct, honest, safe, out of character communication channel at all times so that we can moderate these things, right? 
Um, and really, I'm just doing what my character would do is an example of, you know, abusing that channel because you're talking out of character. You're using it for a totally self-serving purpose. On the GM side, of course, the GM's version of, of being a jerk this way, um, although unlike, bad, unlike pure bad faith, this is something at least you can kind of correct because someone can do that and you can kind of go, no, you're still responsible for, you know, other things. And often they'll go, oh, I didn't think of it that way. And they'll come back. But um, on the GM side, it's the like, these are the logical consequences within my campaign or the adventure, right? So um, in worst case scenarios, right, you know, you get, uh, you get subjected to something extremely upsetting because the GM feels this is the logical consequence of the adventure or campaign, right? Except, of course it's not, because the GM made it all up, or somebody else made it all up, and the GM is implementing it according to their absolute discretion as godlike controllers of an imaginary universe, right? You know, if the GM wished, if you got captured by bad people, um, they could just serve you strawberry Sundays until you were freed, right? Um, there is, you know, that's not a moral argument. Um, so those are kind of two fallacies that are joined, and they're really the same fallacy, which is um, making a moral defense out of, you know, out of pure fiction, right? Um, when instead, of course, what we can do is we can criticize that by saying it's not serving that function of being entertaining, right? Um, of being entertaining or fulfilling, and it's causing harm. So, you know, we can go, you know, we can say not to use these things. Um, I would say another piece of advice um, would be often you you know, we have, well, I mean, a common sense one is, again, you know, having the convention of the player not being the character, right? Similarly, the GM isn't the NPC. Um, and this is a common sense one for when, you know, you have a game master who likes their NPC a little too much and has them as a self-insert that kind of takes over. Now, I'm not a I'm not opposed to GM PCs, and in fact, in my regular game, um, our GM regularly has a GM PC, and they're actually useful because usually um, they fill whatever niche is lacking in our group. Because um, you know our group is definitely you know the party of bards type a lot of the time, where like we just don't check with each other about who's going to make what at all. And so we all show up with like a party of like massively lopsided competencies for a like trad team based game like D&D. Um, you know, so it's not automatically bad, but at the same time, um, you shouldn't identify, you know, uh, you should maintain that divide as fictional as it is, because of course your character doesn't exist. There's only you. But what you should do is you should have that out of character channel going um so that you're checking in so that people know the difference between your character being mad and you being mad and so on and so forth right uh and your in-character channel right and maintaining that conceptual divide is important and maintaining that conceptual divide on the gm side not just with individual npcs but also <coughs> with well with a lot of the things that i think are changeable by character action but the GM would like to remain fixed, right? Like maybe, maybe loosen your grip when, when the characters accidentally smoke the, the bad guy in like the first act when you decided to have the bad guy show up and chortle and then they were gonna go away, but instead your PCs ambushed them and beat them up. Um, that happened in a Warhammer fantasy role play game that I was playing, uh, where we were supposed to like tag along with this, um, you know, witch hunter frenemy, right? He was supposed to be a real jerk, but also lead us on to adventure. Um, 
And I think the GM at the time was really thinking in terms of a classic D and D DM, where like if you bring a high level character in to guide low level characters, then you know, if the low level characters turn on them, the low level characters don't really have a chance. But this is Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. It's not like Dungeons and Dragons. It in the edition we had, the first edition, if you knock someone down, your ability to hit someone after you knock them down doubled. So we, and also they don't get super tough or a lot of hit points or anything in Warhammer. So we knocked this person down and we gave him a boot party. Uh, <laughs> and then we left. And, the, and, you know, and the GM was struggling to figure this out and had like a druid attack us and be exactly the same kind of obnoxious. And we freed ourselves and we beat up the druid. So... Finally, the third time around, uh, he realized that, you know, while bringing forth a parade of, of frenemy guide characters who would be obnoxious and we would beat up was not going to get us to the Darklands um, and whatnot. So, you know, instead, he tried something else and there was someone who needed, you know, and we, you know, guarded the old merchant caravan, right? Uh, and in fact, because we established that um, that we were interested in the social end of play, because each of these beatdowns happened after some terse discussion uh, <laughs> first, where we're trying to figure out what these people are about. Um, but he just he noticed that, and then we, you know, had a side quest with some palace intrigue and things like that, and it was great, and it opened up all the possibilities in his own campaign right because often a gm is their own worst enemy because they get focused on i have this great idea for this three act adventure arc story and what do you mean no come back go do that other thing, right but in fact they have already built things in their campaign or the campaign world has these things has these story ideas that they don't pursue right because because they're not thinking of it because they're thinking of their narrow plot Right, because they're identifying with their narrow plot, because they're thinking themselves as the author of the adventure, right, um, and not the moderator. And it is the same in terms of a dynamic as over-identifying with your character, right? Those are two sides of the same coin. And do, 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 do. I'm just looking at my notes, and. Uh, so, yeah, okay. So often, um, in a long time in indie RPG circles for a while, there was something called a dressing premise, which is like, you know, the system, you know, should speak directly to the kind of play that you want to do, right? And that's not a bad principle, right? Um, however, a dressing premise is also something that can be thought of as a GM skill and a player skill. So now the typical premise, of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, for example, is a team of people with various skills go and explore a dangerous place, right? A lot of D&D &D games are that, right? D&D &D can be almost anything, but let's just say that that's the basic premise of D&D, &D, and D&D's &D's mechanics are slanted toward that experience. <coughs> now, are you the player addressing the premise of Dungeons and Dragons? when you decide that, you know, you're not going to team up with the other characters when you meet them in whatever situation the DM puts you together to meet in, right? Whether you gather in a bar or you're all from the same village, right? Is it really helping anyone for you to decide, I don't like that guy. I'm not going to go on that adventure unless I am further convinced, right? No, you're not addressing the premise, right? You're deciding, you're going to the GM and you're going, oh, you want me to have an adventure? Make me. And what is the point of that? <laughs> um, so that, you know, that is you not addressing the premise. In modern age, actually, we have, uh, um, we have a specific bit of your character to deal with that, and that's called your drive. Um, you know, instead of alignment, what we have is we have a personality trait. And the key part of the personality trait is that it drives you to get involved in the adventure. 
and that's the and that's the thing with every drive right so a basic part of making a character in modern age is you make someone who wants to get in trouble right who wants to engage with the premise um and it can be for all kinds of reasons but it still has to be like that right um on the gm side you have uh sometimes gms get in the weeds when it comes to addressing the premise of the game with the rulings and rules and things like that right so like one example is when the gm decides to go on a tear about the like you know about the deep backstory of the campaign when it isn't relevant at the moment right like if someone wants to tell you, you know, about how in their campaign world, the giants farm these giant plants and they're the best farmers and however, they're bad at smithing. So they trade with this other civilization and blah, blah, blah. And that's great work for you as the GM to figure out why there's a fancy sword beside an enormous carrot. Um, however, the players just need to see there's a carrot and a sword on that giant table right? <laughs> and they're both huge right um so they don't need to know that stuff right so you should get along um now in, and it also applies to things like rules right like certainly you want to make sure you're running the game fairly but at the same time um if something if a game system is repeated or the way you're interpreting it is repeatedly dragging you out of the experience of the game um then yeah you should change it right that is a way of addressing the premise better uh i guess one example of that that always comes up is uh is grappling right because all role-playing games are <laughs> you know kind of have grappling if uh unless they're not combat focused at all right a lot of them have trouble with grappling because well because the thing is is the you know evolutionary lineage of role-playing games goes back to highly abstracted war gaming um which a uh, combination of medieval war gaming and early modern era naval war gaming which is where hit points come from. If we want to get into the deep, nerdy lore of, of where Dungeons and Dragons comes from, um, you know, so things are kind of approximated into combat being, you know, I hit you with a thing and I deprive you of, a, and I deprive you of a certain amount of a linear resource, right? Um, so the solution to that system problem isn't you know, despite the fact that we kind of lived through the third edition era thinking it was to have, <laughs> you know, take an attack of opportunity or take a feat and then go through this excruciating system um, that removes all of the abstraction built into the evolutionary line of Dungeons and Dragons, um, you know, so that people can really feel like they, they grabbed onto a dude that one time. Um, you know, so how I would address premise is probably that I, you know, well, this is what we do in modern age, right? Is our grappling is a stunt, right? The basic currency of combat rem remains reducing a uh, loose resource, right? Um, health or fortune in the expanse. But, you know, um, maybe I get, uh, you know, if I want to do something special, that is something with dramatic import, it's a stunt um and in age it's no different from other stunts right it's nor no different from you know um it's no different from getting an extra attack in because you're super fast or intimidating someone with a flourish or any of those things which you can do with other stunts right and grabbing someone and chucking them on the ground is just the same right sorry that gets a little more into heavy design side and we're at nine o'clock um Vic, how long are we going? I have time for more. Uh, it's it's whatever you want to do, Malcolm. The main stage is Green Ronin stage. Oh, shucks. Well, I will go on a little while longer because I think people and probably want to do things other than listen to me all night. Your so. disc of 3.5 just made me laugh my ass off. <laughs> I was going to say it. 
put it out there. That was fun. Yeah. You know, All right. I will, I will question myself about that, however, because the thing is, is that, you know, there are different movements in, in role playing, right? And 3.5 was certainly, you know, the penultimate evolution of a certain way of conceptualizing and playing Dungeons and Dragons, right? Which was a super formal game mechanics oriented way of playing it, right? Um, where you were encouraged to look for the loopholes and exceptions, right? And, uh, and rules mastery was kind of a thing, right? That was explicitly talked about in the rule and in writing about about D and D by the designers, right? Like for example, uh, I think I read something from Monty talking about yeah, you can take the toughness feat, but it's not as good as other feats, right? By design, and then that's why you got in the three point five era where like you know. You had a serious divide between game. Okay, that's a good example. Okay, the sorcerer and the wizard. In a game with rules mastery, the wizard is way more powerful than the sorcerer. In a game without rules mastery, the sorcerer kicks the wizard's butt. Um, and that's because in a game with rules mastery, a wizard has so many more optimization tools than a sorcerer, right? The, the build potential is just fantastic, right? But if you want to like sling magic tactically on the fly, a sorcerer is just better. Um, and a wizard can be just, you know, and a wizard can end up weaker than a sorcerer, right? And there are all these little things. Um, I'm actually going to just totally go off topic since we're past nine. So uh, one of the things that I discovered, I did sit-ins with people playing D&D for a long time. And one of the things I discovered is, you know, Okay, I have two insights. The first is that a rogue is powerful based on whether or not you're using a map in miniatures. If you have a map in miniatures, rogues are terrifying because when rogues get in, get into positioning that trigger their abilities, they are so strong um you know when you know whenever they're capable of doing sneak attack and usually uh they're capable of doing sneak attack over and over again in a mapped ministry using combat however once we get into what i guess people call theater of the mind these days uh you get dms who are much more conservative and they don't want to give rogues those opportunities because it turns from something that takes place in an objective map space to basically asking permission for this to be a narrative influence in your game, right? And so the GM goes, oh, not time yet, right? That's what they're really doing, um, you know? And so, yeah, that makes a huge difference. The other thing, too, that I discovered is that, sure, 3.5 clerics are overpowered, and that was to bribe the player for not playing the hero, right? because nobody did cleric storylines. Nobody did storylines about, you know, somebody's crisis of faith or temple politics or anything like that. Um, so cleric, sure, clerics should be good at fighting and good at healing and cast all these spells. Um, and on paper, they should overshadow everybody else. But they just don't have, you know, people just don't give them the same, they don't give them the same story juice as they do the fighter, right? And this has been true in like, virtually all editions of D&D, except for maybe four. Um, because, you know, in first clerics were amazing as well, right? And second clerics are amazing, third clerics are amazing. Uh, you know, fifth is a little different. Um, and fourth was a lot different. But, you know, what remains still, even in first edition, right? You know, um, if you have a fighter, a cleric, and a magic user, the story is about the fighter, it, as much as about any characters, it's about the fighter 50% of the time and the magic user 40% of the time and the cleric 10% of the time. <laughs> right? So, so clerics never feel overpowered, even when they're overpowered mechanically, right? So you have a lot of, of these things that are subtle narrative and story-oriented influences on games that are supposed to represent a very 
objective, game mechanics focused, play oriented approach, um, or technical play oriented approach. I guess the other thing, hmm, the other thing I wanted to talk about, I'm gonna have to look at my notes again. Oh, yes. Uh, I wanted to do another like thing that works as good advice on both sides, right? And I've talked about railroading before. So obviously we don't want railroading. Um, however, we also don't want play that is totally directionless, right? There are a couple of fixes for these. One of the fixes is as uh you know what we call hex crawls um or you know general map crawls or point crawls when the space you know when there are individual locations we can kind of move to freely <coughs> but you know we don't want we uh, we don't have our bare hexes with nothing in them um right and that kind of turns a map into a sort of ad hoc um story tree because you know i go to the village of hamlet and i have my experiences at the moat house near the village of hamlet and sure there's a story that lets me go to the temple of elemental evil but i can just go somewhere else on the map right and i have that total freedom um however that doesn't always work because sometimes you go to blank spots in the map and sometimes you lack motivation now one thing that we often do is we kind of leave it to the gm to solve the problem of like not putting things on rails but at the same time giving us an interesting story right and that should be the gm's responsibility certainly um but also it's kind of a player responsibility too. And part of it again, is that open channel of communication um, out of character to let the gym know what you want. And part of it is not making decisions tactically, but also dramatically, right? Um, and that means that thinking, it means that you think out of character about what you want your character to do, because you think out of character about how you will entertain other people with your character's actions, right? Instead of just going, I'll do what my character would do and uh, and then kind of letting the chips fall where they may. Okay, and I think I've covered everything on my notes now. Um, does anybody have any questions, insights, something they want covered, problems they've had, um, anything? I guess not. <laughs> no, you, you covered a lot of really good and interesting topics. So thank you for that. Well, um, I am sorry that I didn't have much in the way of visual aids. Um, <laughs> I was going to do a PowerPoint presentation, but OK, I'm going to admit this. Um, I finished a lot of Star Trek because the premiere of oh. season four of Discovery was on. And I had my friend over and we ate Indian food and I forgot completely about doing a PowerPoint presentation for today that I was going to show along with other cool stuff. Um, I thought you were going to say you binged Wheel of Time or something like that. No, I saw Wheel of Time the other night. Um, I Like, yeah, let's just talk about media now. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I haven't read the books. Like, I'm vaguely... Me either. Yeah. They're huge. It's fourteen books. That's a lot. Yeah, I'm vaguely aware of. You know what? If if you want to, if everybody wants to, like, there aren't a lot of people here. If everybody wants to unmute and say whatever they want to say, please. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's let's break this down. Yeah, the wheel of so, time is a challenge. Yeah, the wheel of time is. A challenge. I found it like because I knew there was some like weird gendered stuff with the magic, mm -hmm. so I saw that they toned that down a little bit. Like mm -hmm. not completely, but they toned it down a little bit um it is very you can really tell that it was a fantasy series written by the nine written in the 90s because of all the swords that look like katanas that characters have mm -hmm. certainly certainly it was a glorious age for the katana appreciator the 90s totally. uh, <laughs> highlander 
Highlander, yeah, yeah. Um, oh my goodness. But uh, yeah, I thought it wasn't bad. I think one of the things though that got me was that uh, watching it. Well, um, there's like there are these things called Trollocs, which I didn't don't really know anything about, right? That are these monsters that are basically like they're kind of like the size of D and D gnolls, mm -hmm. right? Like they're like they're like these seven eight foot tall like you know monster people, right? And one thing the Wheel of Time show does the show that does that's very good is it makes you realize that like the generic plot of gnolls attack a village would be bloody terrifying. <laughs> like they stage it, they stage it like a horror movie, right? These monsters show up and they're a foot and a half taller than anybody else and they start dismembering people and it's the scariest thing in the world. Yeah. And, you know, seeing that visually and relating it back to like one of the most generic of Dungeons and Dragons adventure books. <laughs> yeah. As they like, wow, you have to actually be pretty brave to deal with this, right? Um, but isn't that something else that we tend to do in role-playing games is we disassociate ourselves from our actions so that we don't really feel the, I mean, unless we really play into it, we yeah. don't get a sense of what's really happening here in combat or. Yeah. You know, and that is of course, in many ways, it's a mercy, right? Like one of the things I teach people, um, you know, there's just a technical reason too. like, I teach people how to fight with swords, right? Um, except, you know, one of the things that you quickly learn is a real sword fight would be very boring looking, right? Like the basic response to the most basic cut with a sword is to do the same cut, but arrive slightly beforehand and kill the person. And that's the whole sword fight. <laughs> that's it, right? Uh, you know, in the German tradition, that's called the uh, Zornhau, right? Um, you know, so, you know, you know you do what's want. interesting about that is in my cyberpunk game, because it's a much more deadlier game and the healing mechanics are much more slow, my D&D &D players are having a huge <laughs> adjustment to how slow and how many days it takes to get their hit points mm -hmm. back. And they can't seem to wrap their heads around it and they actually resent it Yeah, because of that. You know, they're just like so used to D and D, and you're magically delicious, and everything's healed. Yeah. But the more realistic it is, right? And then all of a sudden, they have to worry about, hey, I need two or three days to get my body points back, and then they have to. It gets a little bit more real in a sense. Yeah. For them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Troy. Really appreciate everything you, Green Roan has done for us. And thank you, Malcolm. Mm -hmm. As always, you are an officer and a gentleman of well, the RPG to, community. Thank you. Well, I hope to see you in person next year, maybe. So, you know, we're in the same From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> Trevor, I wanted to, there's one other thing with the 